Uh, you go in and you act like a know-it-all. You act like the smartest person in the room. You speak technical. You don't communicate. You don't listen. And they don't believe that you understand the business or they don't believe that you're adding value to the process. They're not going to invite you back. Welcome to Life of a CISO. I'm Dr. Eric Cole, your host, and we'll be taking you on a journey each week on what it takes to be a CISO and what are solutions that you can implement today if you are currently a Chief Information Security Officer or if you want to be one in the future. This is Life of a CISO. Welcome, welcome, welcome to hopefully you know what time it is. It's time for Life of a CISO. With yours truly, Dr. Eric Cole is in the house, and I'm having an amazing week. We're doing a lot more interactive live, Life of a CISO. We did live on YouTube. Uh, make sure you're checking that schedule. Uh, we're going to periodically, I think right now, every other Thursday, but we might start going weekly or even more because I, I, I had such a good time. I want to do more. My team's like, just patience, right? You got to work the process, right? And trust your team. But uh, you know, we're basically going live where you can ask questions, interact, and just uh, get to see what you want, what you need, and how we can help you. And then I also do some live events with ISSA. Once again, all of these are about Q&A. So every week I'm laying down content on this podcast. It's very one-way, right? Communication. And then we're setting up a lot of two-way communication so I can hear from you and see how we can help you. And always remember, you can post messages below, right? You can always put information down below. Also, definitely getting back to normal or new normal or whatever we want to call it. Coming out of the pandemic, doing a lot more keynotes and interviews and Q&As and panels. And I keep getting the question that comes up a lot. Is what is the most important skill of a CISO? And I'm curious, how would you answer that? What is the most important? important skill of a CISO. You wanna know my answer? Communication. The ability to be an effective communicator. Now I truly believe, and I've proven this over and over and over and over and over and over and over in my personal professional uh, life that all problems are created by poor communication and all problems are fixed with effective communication. Now, I want you to recognize the words that I used here because I hear different versions of it with different words and they're not necessarily correct. So I've heard one version of it, and I might have used it, by the way, so don't, don't shoot the messenger, but I, I learn over time and I improve. But one version was all problems are caused by a lack of communication and all problems are solved by an increase in communication. Now, the first part, yes, I can probably see lack. If there's not enough communication, right? That could be problematic. However, just increasing bad communication isn't going to solve the problem. It's going to actually make it worse. And that, that's why you see sometimes people that are having problems in relationships that have basically been together for 15, 20 years, and then they go to counseling and they end the relationship. And everyone's like, but I thought counseling was supposed to fix it. No, what counseling did is it was tolerable because they didn't communicate and they were able to tolerate. Then when you went to counseling, you increased that communication and it was bad communication and you increased it to the point where neither side could bear and they'd be like, we're done, right? We're, we're basically done. So it didn't solve the problem because it was an increase of bad, but it gave them awareness to recognize what they did or did not want to have, what they did or didn't want to have. So what we're talking about here really is ineffective communication causes problems and effective communication solves problems. And I really don't want to get in 
to being Dr. Phil here because that's just dangerous categories uh, and things like that. So I'm really going to shift this very quickly to being a world-class CISO and communication with executives in the workplace. But I did want to briefly mention that communication is a critical skill. If you can master the art of communication, you can have an amazing life and accomplish a lot. If you are a terrible or poor communicator, you're going to struggle and get frustrated. Now, before we get in to effective communication of a CISO, because it is your most powerful yet lethal weapon. If it is used correctly, it can make you one of the most powerful people in your company and give you world-class status. If it is used incorrectly, it will be lethal and kill your career and kill your ambitions to want to be a CISO. So this is a very powerful weapon. However, most people don't understand this weapon. If you don't understand the capabilities of this valuable tool called communication, you're going to use it incorrectly. So let's just start off basically. What is communication? And I always love this because it's sometimes the obvious that people don't know. I do this with my coaching students. I go, what is the definition of communication? And they struggle. You, you know what the definition of communication that most people tell me? Oh, it's speaking and telling people things. Communication is giving people your opinion, giving people thoughts. For example, when you're on stage and you're giving a keynote address, that's communication. And that's the problem. The definition they just gave is not communication. It's talking. Talking, if we sort of get down to the mathematics and explain why, is really one third of communication. So, so let's, let's see where I'm going here. Communication is exchanging information with somebody in a two-way exchange. So there's a connection and there's an understanding and there's an interface of information. So you're exchanging data that the other person understands and you're connecting with that person. You're setting up an interface to that other person in which information flows you're setting up energy and you're understanding that other person and you're providing information back to them that they understand. It's sort of this, this dance that goes back and forth, which means if we break down the components, communication is speaking and listening. It's those two components. Now, where I went mathematical on you is quite simple. Speaking, listening, speaking, listening, right? For those of you that don't have video, uh, when I'm saying speaking, I'm pointing to my mouth, which how many of those do you have? One. And when I say listening, what am I pointing to? Your ears. How many of those do you have? Two. So if you think about it, you have three mechanisms for communicating. Two of them are meant for listening and one of them is meant for speaking. So if we want to get a little basic mathematics here, one third of the components we have are for talking and two thirds are for listening. Hmm, could there be something valuable there? Right? Could that be something that could be important to us, right? When you're communicating, first question, how much of the time are you speaking? Well, let's ask the real question. Because this is, this is right here, the gem of communication. It's not how much of the time are you communicating? Are you speaking? Sorry, how much of the time are you speaking? It's how much of the time are you trying to speak? Because if you're talking... And all I'm thinking about is 
I want to speak. I want to talk. I want, and you're like, but, but, you, you know, you, you keep trying to like interrupt the person or jump in or this or that, and they don't want to give up control. What's the problem with that? You're so focused on what you want to say, and you're so focused on interrupting the other person that you're not listening to what they're saying. So they could technically be speaking for two thirds of the time, but if those two thirds, you're focused solely on, I wanna talk, I wanna talk, I wanna talk, here's what I'm gonna say, here's what I'm gonna say, you, you really didn't do any listening. You didn't do any listening at all. So this is a big problem for CISOs and here's why. World-class security engineers, which is where many CISOs come from. What makes a world-class security engineer is that you have knowledge and expertise that other people want. So typically, when a world-class security engineer is asked to come to a meeting, it's typically for their advice to answer questions and they're mainly there to speak. So they get comfortable giving their opinion and sharing their opinion and talking most of the time. So if you look at communication, and I've studied this with a lot of world-class security engineers, in their role as a world-class security engineer, they're gonna spend 60 to 80% of the time speaking and then 20 to 40% of the time listening. So now, if they go into a CISO role, even if they're business, even if they've read business books and they understand business, they're now going to go in the room and want to speak 60 to 80% of the time. And that's problematic for several reasons. First, when you're a security engineer, if you're world-class, you are probably the smartest person in the room or one of the smartest, right? If you're around other world-class security engineers. But the point is, if you know your domain of cybersecurity and you are a true expert of 12 to 15 years, you are an authority on that subject. And when it comes to cybersecurity, you are probably one of, if not the smartest person in the room. Here's the issue. When you now become a CISO, and you go to talk to executives and you go to board of directors and you go to the boardroom. It is now a business discussion. It is talking about business and increasing revenue and increased profit. I can almost guarantee if you come from a cybersecurity technical background, you are not the smartest person in the room anymore. And to be fair, and this is for me, especially if you're a newer CISO, when it comes to business and understanding the business, let's face it, you have been in that domain the shortest out of anyone in that room. You're one of the newest members. You're least familiar with the company. So if we're really honest, you are probably the least smartest person in the room when it comes to the business and understanding business and understanding that specific business, which means you should be speaking very, very little in the beginning and talk, sorry, you should be speaking very, very little in the beginning and listening a whole lot. And when you do speak, it should be to gather additional data by asking clarifying questions. If you are a new CISO or you are fairly new to the company, and we're talking even six to 12 months. You should be very careful of, unless it's directed cybersecurity, directed towards you or others, but if we're talking business and others, you should be very careful of speaking and giving opinions until you really understand the domain and the target. So first big takeaway, as a chief information security officer, especially if you want to become a CISO or you're a brand new CISO, when you're meeting with executives and you're in the boardroom, except when questions are directed towards you, you should listen 
a lot more than you speak. And when you do speak, you should ask very articulate, specific questions that gather additional data to help you be more effective in that role. If we could get CISOs just to do that, that piece right there, that solves a lot of our initial problems. And here's why. What happens with most CISOs is they come in and assuming they got the job, they ace the interview and they go and sit down to speak with the executives and speak with the board of directors. Now, that first meeting, the first time that CISO meets with the execs and meets with the board of directors, it is critical because if you do a good job, you'll get invited back. If you do a bad job, you won't get invited back. There are no second chances here. All right, so this is very, very important you pull this off because they're not going to give you three strikes. This ain't baseball, all right? You go in and you act like a know-it-all. You act like the smartest person in the room. You speak technical. You don't communicate. You don't listen. And they don't believe that you understand the business or they don't believe that you're adding value to the process. They're not going to invite you back because you essentially waste of time, and it's a distraction. And that, unfortunately, is a really, really good description of what happens to most CISOs. Because I talk to a lot of executives that basically have what we call disjointed, unhealthy, or broken relationships with their CISO, where they really don't talk to them that often, they don't really involve them, and what I always get when I ask the questions is, Eric, we tried, but it just doesn't work. They don't speak our language. We don't understand what they're saying, and we just don't get it. And that right there is the problem, communication. So if you want to be a CISO or you're getting a new CISO job, you need to make sure that doesn't happen. Now, the question I get back is, but Eric, what if that did? What if I'm existing CISO six or nine months and I'm in that exact predicament where I don't get invited to the meetings anymore? I don't get involved anymore because ev evidently that happened and I'm not included anymore. Great. It is fixable. But remember, Second chances are even more important than first because if you blow it once, they might give you a second chance. But if you blow it a second time, it's very rarely you'll get a third. So you have to make sure you nail it. So the way you do this is you start communicating back in business language. So what I would recommend is once every one or two weeks, you want to start light you send a very specific business question to a COO or CFO. Don't start yet at CEO level. You want to start with one tier down, the COO, CFO, chief legal counsel. And you want to be pretty brief about an, a business question with asking for advice and say, I know you're super busy. I'd be happy to come by and talk with you, or if you'd be happy to send a reply, that would be great. Now they're going to read this and go, wait a second. I, I, I thought this CISO person didn't get business. We, we sort of disconnected them because they didn't really communicate. They didn't get business. They wanted to be the smartest person in the room. They didn't speak our language. We didn't understand. They weren't adding value. But th this looks like a different person. Seems like a different person. So they'll probably give you a chance. And ideally, they'll say, yeah, come by my office. And then when you come by your office, you need to be that different person. You need to listen a lot. Hey, that's a great point. But, but, but I want to make sure, can you give a little more detail on how to do X? Because I, I want to make sure I really understand what you mean by that. 
and then you get more data. And here's the trick. Let that meeting flow. And when you made a good connection and you got the data, let the meeting end. Whether that's 10 minutes, 20 minutes, or 30 minutes. We have this idea that meetings and communication is based on a quantity factor, not a quality factor. Well, if the meeting went 45 minutes, it was good. And if the meeting went 10 minutes, it was bad. And most of the time, it's the opposite. Most of the time, 10 or 15 minutes, you accomplished what you wanted. And if you ended it there, it would have been an amazing meeting. But because you felt you had 30 minutes blocked on the calendar, you felt it had to go for 30 minutes. So you kept pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. And then it went bad. Because if you're pushing something beyond comfort where you don't have much to say, they don't have much to say, you're more likely to fall back to bad habits and remind them why they didn't invite you to the meetings in the first place, right? Which you do not want to do. So if it's 10 minutes, if it's just end it and let that go. And then keep doing that a few times. And then what will start happening is they'll start talking among the executive ranks of the COO, CFO going, maybe we made a mistake. We're concerned about security. Security comes up in every board meeting. And I've had a few meetings with that CISO person and they seem to get it. Maybe, maybe we misunderstood. Maybe they were just nervous. Maybe they just had a bad day. And what you'll find is if you do that correctly, you'll get an invite back to the board of directors meetings. And then that's your make or break because then you do it for the entire team and then everyone walks away going, wow, we need this person in our meetings. This person listens. This person gets it. This person is a very, very effective communicator. And then you got a huge win. Here's the irony. In most cases, when somebody says, that was a great conversation, or people say, that person's a really good communicator, if you look at and dissect down the conversation that happened, it's because they listened, they connected, they asked questions, and they provided value. That's ultimately what it comes down to. It's not because they spoke the whole time. And this is where you got to get really clear in your mind. This was a hard thing for me. Speaking and communicating are two different things. They're not the same. Because I used to say I was an amazing communicator because I could get up and do a keynote in front of 2,000 people and crush it. Just do a great job, provide tons of value, connect with the people, they come up, get lots of accolades, get lots of thank yous from the people that presented it, get asked back to the conference each year. So I was very good at public speaking. I was very good at teaching. But I was noticing in other areas, one-on-one, -on -one, I was not very good. And it's because I was good at speaking, but I wasn't good at communicating because I wasn't good at listening and connecting. And where that hit home for me was, you, know, you always sort of want to do self-evaluation, is I was talking to somebody, I said, listen, it's most bizarre. It's the most bizarre thing. I'm talking with one of my coaches, and they go, most people are terrified of public speaking. And do you realize public speaking is the number one fear? I mean, people have public speaking over drowning, car accidents, and other things. It is their number one fear having to go up on stage and speak in a bunch of people. I love it. No issue, no anxiety. I like, I get energized by it. I'm like ready to go. It's like, here we go, right? And especially at the big conferences where they, they play your, your theme music as you come on stage, right? right? Or, or 80s rock or stuff like that. It's just, I mean, you're, you're ready to go. I love it, I love it, I love it. But then I said, but here's the interesting thing. When I have to go to cocktail parties 
where I have to go one-on-one -on -one and like mingle and talk and meet people or one-on-one -on -one meetings terrifies me. Terrifies me beyond belief. I do not like it. I am not comfortable. It is not something I enjoy. And my coach was like, well, why do you think that's the case? By the way, really good coaches actually just are great communicators because they ask you questions so you come up with the answer. I, if I told you the answer, when I coach you, you might or might not listen. But if I ask you a series of questions to get you there, right, effective communication. Notice, effective communicators ask questions. Effective communicators control the conversation. Effective communicators lead to a solution. They lead to an outcome. And what I realized is the reason why I don't like cocktail parties and I don't like one-on-one -on -one is I'm really not a good listener. I really wasn't good at listening. I, I enjoyed speaking and I wanted to tell everyone how smart I was, right? And some of the times I were and a lot of the times I was not the smartest person, but I just love talking. And I was not good at listening and I was not good at hearing and processing what the other person was saying. So I was a great speaker, but a terrible communicator. And I'm still working on the listening part, right, and the helping out. But, but some of the tricks that I've given you is first, just take inventory. Like after you leave a meeting, just take general inventory. How much of the time was I really listening? Was I really listening and connecting to what the other person was saying? Not that I was checking emails or dwindling or saying you were taking notes and you weren't taking notes. Yeah, I know that, Gabe. Or that you weren't speaking, but you're like, I want to speak, I want to talk, or you're thinking about, oh, I think I'm going to go have dinner tonight at somewhere, blah, 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 right? And, and you're not paying any attention to what they're saying. But, but really ask yourself, how much of the time was I really, really listening to the other person? And then use that as your baseline. I'm not here to judge. Was it 5%? Was it 10%? Was it 50%? Was it 80%? Now, I'll be honest with you. If you're getting 60% or higher, really question, am I really being honest? Was I really fully engaged in listening for 60 to 70% of the time? Now, maybe... Maybe you're listening to this and you're just confirming a lot and you're the most amazing communicator. But that's very, very unlikely. Most people, when you really get a third-party person, is about 20 30%. And we need to improve that. So really get honest with yourself. And then any time you're talking with anybody, really focus on, I want to improve my listening. I want to listen more. I want to listen more effectively. Now, here's the coolest part. How you do one thing is how you do everything. So very rarely are you going to have a person that's an amazing communicator in the boardroom and a terrible communicator with their spouse or an amazing communicator in the boardroom or a terrible, terrible communicator with their kids. doesn't work that way, right? Either you're good at it or you're not. Either you're an amazing communicator all the time or you're not. So if you find this scenario where you think you're world-class communicator in the boardroom as a CISO, but then you say, yeah, I'm really not that good to communicate with the kid. Yeah, you're probably not that good to communicate with the boardroom, right? You're probably not doing as good as you want. So that's really first thing I really want to raise your awareness. And remember, two ears, one mouth. You really want to increase the listening. World-class CISOs listen and listen a lot. Second big takeaway, as I start to wrap up, world-class CISOs ask a lot of questions. They want to get the clarifying details. So when they do speak, they are very authoritative and knowledgeable. If you're not sure about information or you're not sure about data, it is better to ask a question than it is 
to guess and get it wrong. So as we start to wrap up this week, I just want you to be really conscious. Every time you're talking to folks, I want you to focus in on two things. How much time am I listening? Am I really understanding what they're saying? And then when I do speak, how much of the time is sharing my opinion versus how much of the time is asking clarifying questions? And you'll find if you listen more than you speak, you ask clarifying questions before you give an opinion, you're going to noticeably recognize differences in your overall communication. And here's the trick. You need to be in the boardroom. You must be in the boardroom. You must be able to be a trusted part of the executive team. And if you are not a good communicator, if you do not listen and you recognize when it comes to business, you're not the smartest person in the room and you don't have the reputation for being an amazing communicator, that will not happen. And if you're not in the boardroom, you're not engaged and you're not talking with the executives, it is almost impossible for you to be a world-class CISO. So spend some time this week, this month, and this year focusing in on being a world-class CISO by being a world-class communicator.